welcome back to another documentary featuring the great periods of the Victorian and Edwardian eras. The eras of innovation and creation, where the best things we know today were created and then finessed. Tango and Cash, Hanky Panky and Ducky Lucky, Batman and Robin, Sherlock and Watson, Jamal and Jermaine, Robin Hood and Little John. Yes, this is the combination famed as Fish and Chips. Famed throughout the world, everybody visits the country and has to try Fish and Chips. But why is it so popular and where did it come from? Those ever burning questions. Well, this documentary is gonna feature the reason that this humble little notion became a favorable pair. You'll be very surprised at its exceptionally humble roots. It's very hard to do this with a dog. He just wants to be part of it all the time. Many food historians say that a young Jewish cook an Ashkenazi immigrant, you have to excuse me on that one, named Joseph Malin opened his first chippy in 1860 in London. The chip shop was so successful that it remained in business until the 1970s. So they have been a very popular concept from their initial conception. Even the dog is so excited about this, he has to be in on the action, don't you? This is partially the border collie, by the way. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to be invited to go and have some of the best fish and chips in Manchester. And this is how it went. central Manchester location with a great reputation and really good reviews I wanted to try this place out for the documentary But up here in Manchester, the fish and chips stand opened by John Lees was doing a brisk business by 1863. By 1910, there were around 30,000 fish and chip shops in the UK. They even stayed open during the Great War of 1914 to 1918. In an effort to boost morale at home, Prime Minister David Lloyd George made sure that fish and chips stayed off the ration list. Eggs, bread and meat were on the list. The same practice was observed during World War II when Winston Churchill famously referred to a hot meal of fish and chips as the Good Companions. If you're gonna have the British classic, you've gotta go for the original and pick the cod to go with the chips. There is only one sauce option, tartare. Just to jump in and say really sorry guys, I've forgotten how to eat at this point.
According to sources, British soldiers storming the Normandy beaches on D-Day would identify each other by yelling out fish and waiting for the response, chips. The Americans had a similar system during their campaign also. So on a little side note, I digress, but in relation to that chip shop there, right, somebody did comment on one of my vlog videos, my diaries, saying, oh, you need to go to this place because it's really good. And I did say, funnily enough, I am going there tomorrow to do my filming. So thanks to the guys there for letting me pop in for the sort of half hour and, and do my bits and pieces. And they, they, they didn't charge me. I tried to pay for my fish and chips. I said, no, no, we'll, we'll give you this free. So really appreciate that. It goes a long way to helping sort of get the history of fish and chips out there alongside other things I'm doing. So well worth a visit, guys. Moving on. So yet again, we find out that the bulk of a creation is from the Victorians. But what we always overlook is how the Edwardian period really finalised and classed a lot of these things. Most people think that fish and chips originated in England. This is not actually true, so my apologies to all those other proud Brits, also to those from abroad whose dreams I've now shattered. The real history of fish and chips is traced back to the 15th century in Portugal where the dish was really invented. Like so many other famous dishes, fish and chips were created out of necessity, not culinary genius. People throughout the 1800s often struggled for regular and sufficient nutrition and lacked money for meat. But now we venture into the full story to hear the history of fish and chips and how it became a British staple. A quick fun fact, did you know that the first Friday in June every year is National Fish and Chips Day? The pairing of fish and chips has long been considered a British staple. The irresistible combination of a hunk of battered cod resting atop a mound of steaming hot chips, or French fries as you Americans would have them called, is the quintessential British comfort food. Families gather for such things as Fish and Chip Friday in one of their ways to enjoy this food. It could be eaten on a plastic tray in front of the telly or gobbled down from a makeshift paper cone on the way home from a pub. A meal of fish and chips is like serving deep fried nostalgia of the country. Let's not forget you have to have salt and vinegar. At the dish's peak of popularity in the late 1920s there were 35,000 chip shops in the United Kingdom, Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. Today there are still around 10,500 chippies in the UK serving 360 million meals of fish and chips every year. That is the equivalent of serving six of fish and chips to British man, woman and child. The golden fried combo is so deeply entrenched in British culture that it is hard to imagine a time where there wasn't a fish and chip shop in every neighbourhood. But travel back a mere 200 years, you would have been hard pressed to find a combination of fried fish and chips anywhere in the British Isles. Yes, the origin story of fish and chips is a bit more complex than the nationalist sentiment might imply. Food history tells us that it all began outside of the UK hundreds of years ago. From the 8th to the 12th centuries, Jews, Muslims, Christians lived in relative peace in Portugal, known as Al-Andalus under the Moorish rule. Sephardic Jews, who likely comprised 20% of the population, held positions in high court, but the strength of the Moorish rule diminished over time. As Christian armies started conquering territory by 1249, Moorish rule ended in Portugal. And as we well know, love and relationships cause all sorts of dramas, and that's no difference here because the situation changed dramatically in the 15th century. The first Spanish Inquisition outlawed Judaism. Spanish Jews fled to neighbouring Portugal. Then in 1496, the Portuguese king, Manuel I, married Isabella of Spain, who was not on board with religious freedoms. She insisted on the expulsion of all Jews from Portugal. Manuel I then mandated all Jews to be baptised or otherwise expelled. While many fled, some Jews stayed and either converted to Christianity or pretended to do so while continuing to practice Judaism in secret. The problem is, even when being serious, John Cleese springs to mind and a certain TV series whenever I say Manuel. 
Anyway, moving on. When Portugal fell under Spanish rule, the Inquisition targeted individual Jews with a lineage, threatening anyone claiming to be a converso. As religious violence worsened, many chose to flee to other parts of Europe, with large numbers settling here in the UK. As with many cultures, wherever the Sephardic Jews travelled, they brought with them their rich culinary traditions. Cooking is not allowed on the Jewish Sabbath, which begins on sundown Friday night and ends on sundown Saturday. So Sephardic Jewish families would prepare food on a Friday afternoon that would last for the next 24 hours. One of the dishes was a white fish, typically a cod or a haddock. Fried in a thin coat of flour or matzo meal, the batter preserved the fish so it could be eaten cold and without sacrificing too much of the flavour for the next day. It was a hit. Soon, Jewish immigrants to England took to selling the fried fish in the streets from trays they hung around their necks by leather straps. As early as 1781, a British cookbook refers to the Jews' way of preserving all sorts of fish. Thomas Jefferson, after a visit to England, wrote he sampled fried fish in the Jewish fashion. This takes us right the way forward to my favourite period, one of the two Victorians. In his London-based novel, Oliver Twist of 1837, Charles Dickens referred to fried fish warehouses, the forerunner to the modern chip shop where bread or baked potato was served alongside the fish. A little later in 1845, cook and writer Elena Sawyer, in his first edition of A Shilling Cooking for the People, gave a recipe for fried fish, Jewish fashion, which was dipped into batter, flour, water, then fried. In the Cotswolds, during the 1870s onwards, the first fish and chip shops were formed. But it wasn't until the latter part of the 19th century that the Jewish fried fish fully made the cultural transfer from the streets of London to the broader British populace. And for that, food historians credit two developments. First, the advent of industrial scale trawler fishing in the North Sea. This meant that inexpensive fish could be transported to all corners of the UK by the second development, extensive railroad lines. Fried fish consumption rocketed with these technology advances. So with all that said, what's your go-to if you were to have a fish and chip dinner? What combination is your favorite? Let us know down in the comments. It basically covers the fish bit but what about the second half of the dish? Nobody's entirely sure how fried potatoes became a part of the European diet. Food historians do know that it took a really long time for fried potatoes or potatoes of any kind to even make their way to England. Belgium stakes a claim as the inventor of fried potatoes. The story goes that in 1680, the winter of, it was so cold that the River Meuse located in present-day Belgium, froze over and that the women in the area would turn to cutting potatoes into little fishy shaped pieces and frying them in a bit of oil as to provide sustenance for their families. Going back to Charles Dickens, he mentions in his 1859 novel A Tale of Two Cities, husky chips of potato fried with some reluctant drops of oil, which means that chips had definitely reached England by the mid-century. Fish and chip restaurants were originally called saloons. They became palaces after that. Harry Randall's was certainly the most famous of these venues. Somewhere I'm familiar with, Bradford. I lived there in recent years and it had a whopping 303 fish and chip shops at one time in its history. 900,000 meals were estimated to have been made, averagely, of this amazing combination. In modern multicultural UK, there is plenty of competition for the national dish. In fact, weirdly, chicken tikka masala makes a strong claim, but most food writers, cooks and chefs still regard fish and chips as a culinary symbol of Britishness. Some chippy traditions have changed over the years. For example, during the war years, 
Paper rations meant the fish and chips were served in cones of yesterday's newspapers. That practice went out of favour in the 1980s when it was deemed unsafe for food to come in contact with newspaper ink without a greaseproof paper between it. Traditionally, fish and chips were accompanied by salt and malt vinegar, but younger generations ugh, have turned to curry sauce and heaven forbid, ketchup. Like all great food products and things that are famous, different countries interpret it in different ways. Around the world, somewhere like Australia, would like their tartare sauce. In England, we use the vinegar with the chips. In Belgium, they go for mayonnaise. Apparently in Scotland, they will use brown sauce. That one is weird, guys, sorry, just, just weird. Denmark, remoulade. The US, they kind of stick to the traditionals as far as research will let us know. So there we have it. A very comprehensive guide to how fish and chips became such a British staple and a popular thing in society. Thank you once again for joining me. Great to have you with me. If you'd like to see any particular features on Victorian Edwardian food histories, drop a comment down below and I'm quite happy to look into it. Also, other things from the periods. I'm not limited to just food. We will be expanding along the lines of uh, different things. Not so much too much on the agriculture front, but I'm always open. If you've enjoyed this video, thank you very much. Help us out by subscribing. Please do drop the video a like. And if you would like to support me, there is a link in the description for my newly set up Patreon. We will be bringing out, I say we, it's me. A couple of people might help as time goes on. We'll be setting up a lot of interesting documentaries featuring Victorian Edwardian histories. So thank you very much. Catch you in the next one. Take care.